Keep talking. Check, check. Testing, testing. Check, check, check. Okay. Good. All right. Now say, it's the Maxwell Institute podcast. It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. Very good. Okay. I might use that. (laughs) That's Joseph M. Spencer, and I'm Blair Hodges. This episode kicks off a series of 12 shows about the Book of Mormon. We're doing a deep dive into the Keystone Scripture of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Neil A. Maxwell Institute here at Brigham Young University is right in the middle of preparing a series of books called Brief Theological Introductions to the Book of Mormon. Twelve different authors tackle twelve different parts of the book. Joseph M. Spencer was given the task of First Nephi, the first book in the Book of Mormon, so get ready to meet the Book of Mormon again for the first time. Brief Theological Introductions to the Book of Mormon. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. If you're interested in learning more about the new book series, Brief Theological Introductions to the Book of Mormon, check out our website, mi.byu.edu slash brief. Joseph M. Spencer, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thanks. Glad to be here. It's good to be with you. I've known you for a long time, so yeah. it, it's fun to sit down with a friend um, <laughs> and, and talk about a project they've been working on in, in a little bit more of a button-down setting. I'm sure we're going to be very professional and very boring. <laughs> yes, uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking about your book, uh, your new book, A Brief Theological Introduction to First Nephi. Yeah. This book is the first in a series of 12 volumes that the Maxwell Institute is doing. These books are taking fresh looks at the central scripture of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Brief Theological Introductions. Now, theology is a word, I think, Joe, that Latter-day Saints don't typically use very often. That's right. So let's start with that word. Why theological introductions? Yeah, uh, I think what the word, what at least what I would want to try to capture, and I think what the whole series captures in a sense, is that there's a difference between theology and other kinds of readings. Uh, two extremes, we might talk about a certain kind of historical reading that's going to say, so what does this text mean in its original historical context? Can we sort of pile up data and decide what that means? Uh, and then we've got a kind of monolithic, here's the meaning of the text, scholarly reconstruction. At another extreme, something like a devotional reading where I might just take a verse at a time and I want to reflect on what that means for me in my life and so on. Uh, theology is somewhere between the two, right? It pays attention to the life of devotion and asks about uh, sort of the rich religious meaning of the text. But it's also a scholarly endeavor and wants to make sure it draws on the best historical research and the best scholarly work on a text, but then ask, can we draw from the text possible meanings that help us shape religious life? But it's not sort of a private devotional endeavor. So it's, I think, stuck somewhere between these two and tries to capture the best of both and then do something of its own as well. I'm thinking of someone like Hugh Nibley, who used to talk about differences between theology and revelation. This was kind of a big yeah. point for him. How do you address that issue? Yeah, Um So there are various ways people have talked about theology. One of those is something like systematic theology, where we're taking all the doctrines, so to speak, that there are, and then systematizing them, creating a kind of hierarchy and unpacking every one of them in a kind of hyper-rationalistic way. And that, I think, is what people like you Nibley were reacting against is a certain kind of, well, reason is going to explain everything, right? We can sort of, from point A to point Z, we can lay out the whole meaning of this in this rational system. Uh, And that, I think, really is a problem. And in fact, the very idea of ongoing revelation makes that a difficult idea, right? This whole thing could change, right? (laughs) So... uh, so I think that's why we have, as Latter-day Saints, had certain negative reactions to the word theology. But theology is a really broad field, and there are lots of approaches. And the kinds of approaches I think people will find in the series, and certainly in my own volume, uh, is very different from that kind of approach. Do you think there's a tradition of LDS thought that these books then fit into, even though the word theology itself isn't used? What's the genealogy of this kind of work? Yeah, actually, I think one of the best examples is Hugh Nibley himself, right, who is a very creative reader. Uh, he didn't just slavishly read the text, tell us what it has to say historically, and then say, good, now the church is going to fall in line with that. But he also didn't have a kind of just strictly devotional angle. He was trying to see what possibilities there were in a text, what it could do, how it might mean. Uh, so actually, Hugh Nibley, I think, is a good example of the kind of reading we're thinking of. But others as well. I think Elder Maxwell was a very good example of someone who could probe a text and see its possibilities and and unpack uh, ways we might read it uh, that'll inform us in new ways and speak to our immediate concerns. Okay, so in a set of 
books about each book in the Book of Mormon, I think you as an author face a unique challenge that some of the other authors don't don't face. I think each book kind of brings its own challenge. But with yours, First Nephi is kind of like the Book of Mormon's introduction. So you're introducing yeah. readers to an introduction. Yeah. And as you observe in your introduction, if Latter-day Saints know anything in the Book of Mormon, well, it's First Nephi. And you said that this familiarity can be a blessing and a curse yeah. for someone like you. Yeah, absolutely. I think the difficulty is, uh, I mean, every January, people make goals. They're going to read the Book of Mormon through. <laughs> they stop somewhere in Second Nephi with Isaiah or whatever, right? Uh, and so First Nephi is the book we've read the most. We know these stories. We've heard these stories. But that familiarity means that because we've read it a lot, we feel like we know this book. And if at some point in our lives we decide, you know what, I really want to get serious about the Book of Mormon— we're bored in First Nephi. We feel like we know it, so we tend to move on to other parts of the book to really dig, and First Nephi gets kind of short shrift. So I think it's a challenge to the the challenge I have writing the book is is to try to take something that people feel they know really well and try to show them they actually have missed a great deal. And you say too that First Nephi has shaped Latter Day Saint devotion. It's shaped Latter Day Saint thinking. These are two different categories. Mm -hmm. Talk about those. Yeah, so it's certainly shaped devotion, right? You can you can buy keychains with iron rods. You can right. Uh, it's shaped our everyday way of talking about our own laymans and lemuels who are going astray or whatever, right? It's shaped our devotional lives. The tree of life. Tree of life. Yeah, these are things that are just very present in our devotional life. Um, but it's also yeah, it's shaped our thinking. Um, there's probably more scholarly literature written on First Nephi than anything else in the Book of Mormon. We've tried to track Nephi's uh, pathway through Arabia. We've uh, we've tried to find all kinds of ancient Near Eastern connections running all through First Nephi. We've done a lot trying gives to think us a about set Isaiah. geography there. Like yeah, exactly. We actually have we know where to go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And so, uh, as well as, I mean, they're just they're the the vision, the dream. There's a lot there that's grabbed our attention intellectually. And so there's a lot of work. I'm there's intrigue. It's yeah. this really interesting immediate family story too. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It grabs hold of us existentially. Right. And yeah. says, this is your story. This is, this is live. This is real. And so we've thought about this a lot. Did you have to go through drafts in terms of figuring out how to parse the book up or did it, did it come pretty easily? I've worked, uh, I've worked on first Nephi for a long time for various projects. And so it wasn't too difficult. I did go through a few drafts of deciding how to divide it up, but there were some obvious things I definitely yeah. wanted to cover, and I just had to figure out how to organize that. And I also saw, because I get to see behind the scenes on these kind of books, um, working here at the Maxwell Institute, one of the things that the editors of the series are really trying to do is make these books really accessible. Mm -hmm. And so talk about the challenge of that. Yeah, well, I'm really glad I, my my last book before this one, I'm really glad I had that experience where I wrote I wrote a book as a series of lectures, like I would give in my classroom. Uh, and that did a lot for sort of calming me down as I write. I, uh, I'm, I'm a theologian and philosopher by training, so I tend to write 10,000 feet up and not in the good way of big, broad picture, but 10,000 feet up in the sense that I'm in the clouds, right? And big um, words and big very words. complicated sentence structure. I, yeah, yeah, and I want to drag people into contemporary French philosophy to think yeah. about <laughs> whatever, right? Uh, so I'm glad to have written this other book that kind of helped me think, how do I do this on my feet? because then I talk like a human being. And so that did help me writing this book. But still, it was a lot of work. I, I went through numerous drafts. I read it, write something, and then have to go, okay, now what words here don't people like to use? <laughs> right? And how many words are people going to have to pull out their phone to look up on, uh, on Google or whatever and try to make it as accessible as possible? Right. So what you ended up doing is dividing your brief theological introduction into two parts. I'm going to kind of give people a sense of how the book is set up, and then we can dive into specifics. So part one is a close investigation into what the book actually says. You're doing a close reading. You're looking at what it actually says, and, and you're looking at the questions that it's asking of its readers. Yeah. We a lot of times think about the questions we bring to Scripture. You turn that on its head. What is Scripture asking of us? What is it expecting of us? That's part one. And then in part two, you focus on the questions that readers today often bring to the book, mm -hmm. what kind of concerns people have. And, and you've had ex a lot of experience with students and, and working with them. So that's kind of the dual structure of your book. What is the book saying? saying and asking of us, and then what are we bringing back to the book and asking of it? So so in part one, let's, let's dig into that a little bit. You're going to closely read the text, looking for patterns, underscoring the author's intention, what Nephi was trying to tell us. But I have a question about that. So as readers, is it really possible to fully <laughs> escape ourselves when yeah. we approach a text like this? Um, I mean, never, right? Never fully possible. We can never fully escape uh, our own questions, our own demands, and so on. 
But the longer we stick with the text, and the more we read it earnestly and honestly and let it press back against us, we can work against our own demands, our own interests, our own uh, investment. Um, but also there's a, there's a strategy, and I use this in the book, I've used it in a lot of places, that I think particularly helps us get out of our own heads with scripture, and that is looking at structure, right? And as much as we can unpack the structure of a text, and of course we can impose structures on a text, but in as much as we can start to see a structure there that is clearly the author's intent and organizes the material, we can start to see what the author is up to and what their intentions and purposes are, regardless of what we were hoping to get out of it. And when you're looking for that structure, you say Nephi is relating history. So he's telling a historical account of something mm -hmm. that happened retrospectively. He's looking back on his life. Um, it, it's important to remember that. He's, yeah. he's not telling this in real time. And so if you look at his structure, you say you can kind of dig out his theological intention. Yeah. Yeah, and the idea there is that, uh, I mean, there are places where he explicitly tells us structural details of the text, and those are really crucial. But there are other places where once you just get the, right, you look at original chapter breaks and these kinds of things, and you start to see, oh, there's clearly pattern and structure here. And once you look at those, you can say, okay, so why is it organized the way it is? This is something like I might do if I'm trying to understand an event. I'm going to some, I don't know, community event on a Saturday, and they've got a number of speakers and various panels or something like that. Uh, if I ask, well, who's the keynote speaker and what panels are organized at what time, I start to understand what the, mu the community event is really about, right? What its intentions are, what its purposes are unless someone's really poor at organizing it, right? Uh, so if I look at structure, it really does seem to tell me what I'm supposed to be getting out of it. And I think we can do that with Nephi. Yeah, as I'm reading along here, and I've, I've read some of your earlier stuff, so I had some, um, I, I had encountered some of your ideas before, but the way that they're structured in this book, the way that you're presenting it in this book is especially clear. So what is the general scope of the story you found in Nephi? What structure did you find? So the largest scale structure is relatively simple. Nephi clearly and explicitly divides first Nephi into two halves, one half where he's telling his father's story, uh, an abridgment of his record, the record of his father. And then a second half where he's telling his own story, what he calls his own proceedings, um, his own reign and ministry. So that's the sort of biggest macro structure, right? Lehi's story, Nephi's story. But then once you see that, those two halves, and especially if you start looking at original chapter breaks, you can ask, all right, so what is Nephi getting from Lehi's story? And how is that supposed to inform his own ministry? And then I think it becomes really clear. The original, original chapters in the Book of Mormon, this is before Orson Pratt sort of shortens them in the 1870s. Uh, the original chapters, there are only two original chapters in the story of Lehi, as Nephi tells it. And so you ask, all right, what are each of these two stories about? And one is clearly how we got the brass plates, and the other one is clearly how we've got this dream of the tree of life. And this seems to be what Nephi's whole story is about then. There are two prophetic sources, uh, this old world, ancient record, uh, especially formed around Isaiah for him. And then there's this new living form of prophecy that's being born with his father. And he wants to think about these two sources. And these end up at the core of the whole second half when he's doing his own ministry. And I have to say, I've read the Book of Mormon countless times, but it wasn't until I saw you ask the question, what are these original chapters trying to do, that I recognized what actually kind of becomes obvious at that right. point. <laughs> yeah, once you see it, you're like, oh, that's there. Like, that's a thing, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think that's uh, I think that's a real power in structure. Once you see it, you can't unsee it if it's a good reading of the text, and it really does organize it. Gives you a kind of way to read and um, a roadmap, right? Yeah, the funny thing to me is the chapter divisions. They make chapters a lot shorter. Orson Pratt did these in 1879, mm -hmm. uh, and they make the book quicker to get through. It feels like you can get to the next chapter. You can get to the next chapter, but as you said, it can also obscure. So it seems like there's like benefits and drawbacks to I think the new chapter exactly right. structure. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's worth saying there, I think Orson Pratt was wise in a certain way. I mean, <laughs> I, I'll tell my students when you're doing your 6 a.m. family scripture study, be really <laughs> glad Orson Pratt did this, right? Because yeah. <laughs> you have these very long mornings. Um, but it's, he was wise. I mean, he was careful. He was trying to do a good job. And sometimes, I mean, he's clearly carving the text at its joints in certain places. Um, but also, yeah, there are places where it does make it difficult to see 
I think what the the original intent of the authors yeah. is. Yeah. So the beginning then kind of talks about the provenance, the origin of the sources Nephi is going to be drawing on. There's the brass plates, the, which he's going to be drawing on for Isaiah, and then there's his father's visions, which he then goes and experiences and, and, experiences yeah. and asks for revelation about as well. One of the most famous passages in First Nephi, I think, happens when Nephi says he's going to liken Scripture to his own people, and Isaiah is the particular Scripture that he seems to use the most. How does your approach differ from typical? Latter-day Saint readings of that instruction to liken scripture. Yeah, so we've often read this verse, and maybe, I mean, one of the most famous verses in First Nephi, uh, and we've often read it to mean something like, I've got to apply this to my everyday life, right? So I've got to find scriptures that somehow speak to where I'm at, what I'm worried about, what I'm praying for. Uh, and I think that's beautiful. I don't mean to criticize that, but I don't think it's what Nephi actually has in mind. Uh, if you look at that verse in its context, actually what's interesting is that verse opens an original chapter. Chapter 19 is actually spanning two original chapters. Uh, and so in the middle of what is now chapter 19, you get the beginning of a new chapter and that's how it opens with this question of likening. Hmm. And you get two or three verses there at the end of verse uh, of chapter 19 that, uh, that talk about likening. And he first says, we were likening this to us I think that plural us is probably important. It's not likening it to himself, but it's likening it to a whole people. Uh, but then he immediately goes on and says, okay, so now I'm going to read Isaiah. He says this to his brothers. And he says, so here's what I want you to do. Isaiah was speaking to all of Israel. You're a branch of Israel. This can be likened to you. And of course, what he's just done in his record is laid out this vision of what's going to happen to that branch of Israel. All of that to say that I think what, Nephi's, uh, what Nephi means by likening is pretty straightforward in the text. It means take Isaiah, find the patterns for how God is working with Israel. Now take a branch of Israel and those same patterns are holding for that branch. They're like each other, hmm. likening. I think that speaks to why you call First Nephi the best handbook to reading Second Nephi. There's a lot of books you can buy on how to read Second Nephi, how to read the Isaiah passages and stuff. And your argument is First Nephi may be the best handbook yeah. to reading Second Nephi. Talk Turns about out, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a this is a key. Um, if we read First Nephi carefully, and Nephi has taught us how to liken, that is, he's taught us here are the main themes I see in Isaiah, and here's how you can extract the the patterns from Isaiah, and then see those as running in parallel to the history of Lehi's children, running right into the last days. Then, when you read Second Nephi, uh, and it's just loaded with Isaiah, you can do the same thing. You can go, oh, here where Isaiah is talking about a remnant, where he's talking about a sealed book. I see what Nephi sees here. He's seeing things that he can extract and say, that's exactly what God's going to do with my brother's children, with my own children in future times. We're going to write a book. It's going to be sealed. There's going to be a remnant. They're going to be redeemed. Isaiah's laying out the pattern. But if we don't see what first Nephi is telling us, we get to second Nephi. And where are we at? What are we looking at? This is all, it seems like I'm supposed to know a whole lot about Assyria or something, right? So do you think if Nephi and Isaiah got to sit down together back then, that Isaiah would have recognized all of Nephi's readings? Or do you think that the way Nephi interpreted Isaiah may have even been surprising to Isaiah? I suspect Isaiah would have been surprised. I mean, I think he would have liked Nephi <laughs> uh, and thought, oh, this is really clever. And part of the reason I say that is that uh, it's clear right within the book of Isaiah, that Isaiah is himself a receiver of traditions and a reinterpreter of traditions. Uh, the prophet Amos uh, is sort of this really remarkable thinker of this idea of a remnant. And Isaiah, just a few years later, is clearly taking these ideas over and recontextualizing and rethinking them uh, and saying, how might this mean now? I think he would have seen in Nephi a kindred spirit. That's Joseph Spencer. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Ancient Scripture here at Brigham Young University. He's also editor of the Maxwell Institute's Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. He's written a number of books on the Book of Mormon, including An Other Testament, which the Maxwell Institute republished a few years ago. But today we're talking about his latest book, First Nephi, A Brief Theological Introduction. Okay, so let's turn to chapter two here. Your, your method of close reading sometimes shines new light on long familiar texts for me. For example, in chapter two, you start with Lehi's dream of the tree and then Nephi's dream. And, uh, you know, f for as long as I can remember, I've read these as Lehi's basic description of a vision and then Nephi's interpretive description of the same thing. Right. But you're seeing something happening on a deeper level here. That's right. I think, uh, I think Lehi's dream read carefully is already Nephi's vision. Um, 
if you uh, if you the thing to note here, we often read Lehi's dream and we see it as sort of one total picture, right? You've got a rod, you've got a path, you've got a tree, you've got a building, you've got a river, uh, and everyone in life has to struggle their way there. Uh, but I think we should be surprised if we read it carefully to note that as soon as Lehi sees the tree, he just walks through it. There's no broth. There's, there's no there's no path. There's no rod. There's no building. There's no river. He's just he just walks and eats. And then he sees his family and he calls them. They just walk and eat or in Laman and Lemuel's case, don't. Uh, but there's no complexity. It's only once Laman and Lemuel don't come and eat that suddenly the vision gets co- complicated. And now there's multitudes and there's paths and rods and all this kind of thing. I think this, the implication is pretty clear. As soon as Laman and Lemuel don't eat, Lehi sees lots of people struggling to get to the tree. And the implication, it seems to me, is clear. These are Laman and Lemuel's children. These are the Lamanites. Over years and years, uh, some of them coming later, say, in the book of Alma or in the book of Helaman, coming to the tree. Uh, and then, of course, in the last days, struggling their way toward the tree, thanks to a rod, this word of God, the Book of Mormon, that's going to be sealed up and come forth. And, uh, and there's going to be this great and spacious building or something like a great and abominable church from Nephi's vision that is going to be a challenge and a difficulty. So I think all of the elements of Nephi's vision are there. They're just sort of hyper-compact uh, presented as symbols, but and I think it's the same story. You also say Lehi's got this more individual focus where he is looking at the family and then Nephi is going to have a more cor- corporate, broader focus. Yeah, that's right. I think uh, Lehi's intense focus is on his family and it starts to broaden at the end of the vision to these multitudes that I think are our whole peoples. Uh, but Nephi is, yeah, he's focused there right from the beginning. And then Nephi is going to speak about plain and precious things that, that would be lost. Does your, does your book shed any light on those things. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> uh, I think it's clear from a number of clues, and uh, I wish I actually had more space in the book to talk about this, but I think a number of clues come together to make clear that uh, the plain and precious for Nephi uh, is uh, Abrahamic covenantal stuff, the covenants given to Israel and how that's unfolding in history. Uh, he calls, very, I think very clearly in First Nephi 19, he tells you what to expect in Second Nephi. Uh, and what he tells you to expect is the plain and precious. And of course, what we get in Second Nephi is Isaiah, Abrahamic covenant, history of Israel, redemption of Israel. Uh, he also tells us in First Nephi 13 that Third Nephi, the visit of Christ, will restore many plain and precious things. And of course, Third Nephi is all Isaiah, Abrahamic covenant, redemption of Israel. This is what Christ talks about when he visits. So I think this is, yeah, this is the core of the plain and the precious. It's Israel's covenant and what that means in all of history. Have you read Terrell Givens's? He His book is Second Nephi. He's following mm-hmm. yours. He also um, said Second Nephi is the most important book. <laughs> of course. Um, I think. Uh, but ha- have you looked at his manuscript? Yeah, yet? I have. Because they, they have some really insightful intersections, I think even though right. you didn't plan that out to begin right, with. We didn't. In fact, we wondered if we should and we didn't. And it worked out nicely. Mm-hmm. I think that, yeah, part of what Terrell is arguing in his volume is that Second Nephi is all about the covenant and that this is what's driving the Book of Mormon. And in a lot of ways, it's what makes the Book of Mormon unique on the 19th century scene. This book is uh, emerging and published and its sort of shock value lies in the fact that it wants to say, hey, all of Christianity. This Abrahamic covenant thing is something you've all forgotten, displaced, symbolized away, uh, rather than recognizing that we've got to gather Israel. How did that fit into the other like covenantal theologies? Because you know you had the the Puritans had a covenantal theology, of things like that. Do you see distinctions there? Because I think some converts were looking for Israel, and yes. that appealed to them. That's right. Uh, I mean, it's a complicated history, as everything always is, right? Uh, And what you have in, say, Puritan theology is a notion of covenant where they are, in some sense, the embodiment of Israel. Israel is a kind of type or symbol of the Christian gathering or something like this. Uh, But most most of the the sort of post-Calvinist theology is not looking strongly at a notion of we've got to go find literal physical Israel and gather them. Uh, There are those who did did certainly see things that way. And there was a lot of speculation in the 18th and 19th century about the identity of Native Americans and are they Israel and so on. But any, if you look at those sources, one thing that's very unique about the Book of Mormon is that those sources that identify Native Americans with lost tribes of Israel or something, they say that they've got to be gathered and taken to Jerusalem. 
the land of their inheritance. Whereas the Book of Mormon says, no, not at all. This is their land of inheritance. Yeah, their the home. Pro- yeah. Yeah, they should and be here. This is their land. So in the next chapter, you're looking at some of the interesting ways that First Nephi speaks about Jesus. There are different titles there, and they're used in different ways according to your close reading. You're seeing, okay, how many titles for Jesus are used? Are they used in particular ways, or are they just used willy-nilly? There's the Lamb of God, the Messiah, and so on. What did you find with these titles? I mean, I think the most interesting finding here is that the Lamb of God is really quite unique. Uh, we're so used to it, right? And maybe in part because we read Nephi. Uh, but we tend to think of this as just a ready, obvious title for Jesus. But if you go digging through the scriptures, Lamb of God only shows up in very specific places. And in the Book of Mormon, apart from, I think it's two references, it's all Nephi's vision. That's it, right? It's there in Nephi's vision, and it's in a few references later back to his vision by him. But otherwise, this is not a standard Book of Mormon title for Jesus which I think should make us raise questions about, so what's going on in this vision and where's this title coming from? What does it really mean? Um, So this I think is maybe the most uh, interesting finding is that that title is, yeah, it's doing something on its own. Um, There are other things that are striking though. Lehi consistently refers to Christ as the Messiah, very Jewish, right? Old Testament-y way of uh, conceiving of Christ. He does not use terms like uh, Jesus Christ. Certainly that name doesn't seem to have been revealed to him. Uh, and he's not using the Lamb of God and so on. He's got a very sort of Old Testament conception. And Nephi is the one who's unpacking a kind of new revelation about what this figure means. And then there's also the the phrase, the eternal father, which yeah. has been updated to be the son of the eternal father. Yeah. Yeah. Running through Nephi and the, through the rest of the Book of Mormon, um, Christ is often referred to as the Father in various ways, right? Sometimes the Eternal Father, sometimes the Everlasting Father, and other terms as well. And yeah, there seems to have been some concern about this in Nephi's vision, especially, so that in 1837, Joseph edits the text, or someone does. We know it's Joseph on certain occasions because his handwriting is in the manuscript, but not in all of them. Uh, and he, yeah, he changes the Everlasting Father or the Eternal Father to the everlasting son of the father. The, the son of the everlasting eternal, father. Yeah, son of, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we get these slight changes. And I think for purposes of clarification, uh, more than anything, especially because as Joseph works his way through the rest of the text for the 1837 edition, he doesn't change other references to Christ as the father. So he, it's, hmm. yeah, a little peculiar that just these few verses in First Nephi, he seems concerned about making sure this is clear that Christ is the son of the father. So the broad view then of part one is that Nephi is trying to create a record that encompasses his people and eventually all the peoples of the world, that that there would come this Messiah that would unite all these people under a particular covenant. And that's really driving what his text is getting at. That's what the Book of Mormon is presenting to its readers. And and your part one covers that. But in part two, the second part of your book focuses on some of the issues – that Latter-day Saints have wondered about in yeah. First Nephi. So one of the biggest ones deals with history, people asking, did this actually happen? How do you handle the question of historicity? Um, well, let me say first, just back up one step to to say, yeah, part of the reason I wanted to, wanted to divide the book in these two halves is because I think there are two ways theology unfolds, right? One is just to track the theology the text itself is getting at. But of course, theology also includes, we've got theological questions of our own. And this is one of the reasons it's worth then saying, I don't want to just say what Nephi himself has to say. We've got questions that need answers. And this this is one of them, right? Questions of historicity and then the other kinds of questions I deal with in the second half. How how do I deal with historicity here? I mean, I think it's important to, uh, to recognize that historical questions about the Book of Mormon matter right? The claims that we as Latter-day Saints make about the book are essential. Um, However, I want to be very careful how I say this, but uh, at the same time, they're not the most important question about the Book of Mormon. If we could show that the Book of Mormon was an ancient document and it has nothing to say to my life, I'm not sure what it would matter, right? It's got to be true and true, right? It's got to be, uh, it's got to be rooted in fact, and it's got to do something for me as a person living a life of faith in Christ. And so part of what I try to point out early in the second half is that we have questions, we have tended, especially in the past, to have questions about whether this Nephi character was a real person. But the questions that keep us up at night tend to be, can we trust Nephi as a prophet? Uh, Given his historical existence, given we're settled on those questions, uh, 
how much can I trust his prophetic vision, his prophetic understanding? How should I shape my life by this person? Yeah, I remember encountering your point where you say, less Latter-day Saints that you know and you encounter in your classes here at Brigham Young University and perhaps in your ward, less of them are wringing their hands about, did this historically happen? More people are wondering whether, not whether it's true historically, but whether it's true to God uh, or whether, you know, whether it has a message from God yeah. to us. And so are its stories and teachings something that ring true to us, that call us to a more ethical or moral life to that call us to Christ. And, and for a lot of 21st century readers, things can get difficult early on in the text, as you acknowledge, with the death of Laban. Is this something that your students have paused at, at reading? Yeah, I'll ask my students just by show of hands, right? How many of you are, have been disturbed by this text? And most, right? Most of them are willing to say, yeah, I've I've had a prophet chopping someone's head off. This yeah. worries me, right? Yeah. Well, how do I make sense of this text? Yeah, this worries people. And it's worth saying, like, if you look at original chapters, this is chapter one, mm -hmm. right? We encounter it now as chapter four, but this is the very opening chapter of the Book of Mormon. And how does the text depict that story? What does your reading do to draw out some points from it? Yeah, so, I mean, my chapter tries to cover a lot of ground because there's the, this is one of the things we've actually collectively written the most about, right? A lot of opinions, a lot of ways of trying to make sense of this text. So I have to kind of survey a lot in the chapter. Uh, but my own take on this is maybe a bit unique compared to the things that have been said. Uh, I think it's very important that Nephi is, he has this encounter with the Lord in First Nephi 2, uh, and he's given two covenants of sorts uh, right from the get-go, his first encounter with God. One of them says, inasmuch as ye, plural, keep my commandments, you'll prosper, you'll be led to a land of promise. There's a very familiar promise from the Book of Mormon. The other one is singular, inasmuch as thou, individual, singular, Nephi, inasmuch as thou keep us my commandments, right? Uh, then you're going to be made a ruler and a teacher of your brothers. There then follows the story uh, of getting the brass plates. And the very first words to Nephi from his father to send them back is, I've been commanded. I've received this commandment. Nephi seems to hear this loud and clear. Ah, commandments. This is what I just heard about. Uh, and now I know what I've got to do. I've got a direction. Anxiety gone, right? And um, But the second thing Lehi says to him is, your brothers are complaining. And the way Nephi tells the story, the two covenants he's been given, one about all of them collectively keeping commandments together, and one about him individually keeping commandments, it seems that this, this report of his brother's murmuring narrows Nephi in on just a second. And the idea that they've got to work together as a people to keep commandments seems to fall to the, back, to the background while Nephi focuses on, if I can keep these commandments, I'm going to be a ruler and a teacher. And he becomes sort of self-arrogating. Uh, and then this sort of explains the story that follows. Nephi finds himself over the course of this uh, attempt to recover the brass plates, slowly alienating his brothers. And then he finds himself standing over a drunken man, constrained by the spirit to do something uh, he doesn't want to do. And here he has to come face to face with what it really means to keep commandment. And ironically learns in the moment that uh, the, he's misunderstood. He's privileged the wrong covenant. Uh, as the Spirit speaks to him, we tend to emphasize, oh, well, the Spirit says it's okay to kill one guy if a lot of people are going to benefit. But that's not what Nephi says about that exchange. He says the Spirit tells him it's better that one man should perish, etc. And he says, when the Spirit said those words, my mind went back and I heard again in my mind the words of this first covenant, inasmuch as ye... And I think what the Spirit's words do to Nephi is not say, it's okay to kill a guy as long as enough people are benefiting. Nephi hears, holy heaven, I've, I've privileged myself here. I thought this was about my righteousness. Uh, I've misconstrued this whole thing. And then something else, uh, something else becomes possible, the formation of a community with his brothers. And as you went through this story, what other possible solutions have you seen Latter-day Saints offer? Because there's, there's a variety of views variety. On, on how to how to explain it. You give your own. How do you situate it in with other? Yeah. So the most, uh, the best known uh, is uh, the legal justification, right? Is it legal for Nephi to have done this? And under the law of Moses, the answer is simply, yeah, 
basically, right? There's there's very good, uh, clear indications in the text that this is supposed to be legal under the law of Moses. This is John Welch has done work on John this, Welch, yeah. especially Fred Essing, a couple of others. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a helpful explanation in certain regards, but for me at least, just because something's legal does not make me feel okay with it, right? There are right. lots of legal things I'm not happy about, right? Yeah. So a legal justification is helpful, but I don't think it gets us all the way. Um, you also get uh, theological justifications that will make a move like um, this is an Abrahamic test, right? Here's Nephi being uh, given a kind of paradoxical commandment, thou shalt not kill, but here I want you to kill. And can Nephi follow a God that seems paradoxical and so on? I think that's beautiful. But it also leaves me a bit cold. Uh, simply, because anything could be commanded. Exactly. Right. Yeah. How do you judge that? And there's a part of it that I think is very philosophically and theologically compelling in the abstract. But concretely, boy, this makes me nervous, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, there are also a number of literary explanations, right? Stories uh, or, or people attending to the way the story is told and showing that there are subtle things going on and so on. And those are interesting. But most of them don't try to solve the problem ethically, so to speak. There's also, it's worth mentioning, there are readings, of course, that just throw Nephi under the bus, right? That say, Nephi's wrong. He did this wrong. Uh, the fact that he takes Laban's clothes and puts them on his body shows that he's becoming the bad guy in this act of violence and so on. So that, that Josh Matson, for example, has given that reading. Uh, so I think there, there's a wide variety of ways of approaching this available. What I'm trying to show is there's at least some aspect of the story that's been missed. That's Joseph M. Spencer. We're talking to him today about the book, First Nephi, A Brief Theological Introduction. Your next chapter focuses on Nephi's family dynamic, his character compared to to that of Laman and Lemuel, his brothers. And Nephi seems like such a fantastic hero when, when you just give it a quick reading. And his brothers sort of come off these pathetic, either pathetic um, grumblers or even murderous villains at some point. So what do your students wonder about this dynamic? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, my first couple of years teaching, uh, I had an assignment where students would write about something that they learned this time through, that they just, something they had assumed about the text that this time through, uh, everything seemed new. And I'd say fully half of them wrote about Laman and Lemuel. Hmm. Uh, most of them rereading it, found themselves sympathetic to Laman and Lemuel and worried about Nephi being unfair to his brothers, uh, which kind of shocked me, right? <laughs> that this many of them were kind of, whoa, wait, wait, I've, I've always assumed they're the bad guys. Uh, and I think a careful read really does show that this is a much more nuanced thing. But yeah, we're in the 21st century, especially, I think more and more people read this and just go, so Nephi is that guy, right? That just annoying, like self-righteous, self the guy who just can't understand that this is complicated. And um, yeah, and it can feel that way, I think, reading Nephi. Part of what I'm trying to do in my chapter there is to say not only that I think that's right in a certain degree, right, that Laman and Lemuel are much more sympathetic characters uh, than we've often given them credit for, but I'm also trying to show that I think Nephi wants us to see them as more sympathetic characters than we've often assumed. What's an example of a clue that leads you to that conclusion? Well, I try to show it from two angles, right? I want to show, one, that Nephi is actually more self-critical than we recognize. And then I also want to show that he's more um, affirming of Laman and Lemuel. So with the latter, I think the best example is actually the way the book ends. We tend to read the whole story of Nephi and Laman and Lemuel and so on with 2 Nephi 5 in mind. The split, the, the attempt at murder, now they're going to divide into peoples. Finally, Nephi is rid of these people. That's where we tend to see the story ending because that's the end of the narrative in 2 Nephi. However, Nephi divides the books by ending 1 Nephi with chapter 22, which means 1 Nephi really ends with Laman and Lemuel reading Isaiah and reflecting on their future redemption. And I think Nephi organizes his book this way for a reason. This is the Laman and Lemuel of 1 Nephi. It's not the murderous people that are going to run off and cause problems for the rest of history. It's this people who will be redeemed because of what's been prophesied. And although he doesn't really give narrative examples of this, you also point to what's been called Nephi's psalm, where mm -hmm. he's lamenting. And he seems to indicate there that he's not been the best brother in every way, too. And he's yeah. talking about his anger and things like that. Exactly. And I think uh, there's really nice little examples, moments in the text where Nephi shows his own fallibility, right? Shows that he has 
often overstepped. Um, my favorite example is in First Nephi 7. You remember they're going back to get Ishmael's family, and on the way back there's this rebellion in the desert. Uh, and Nephi's brothers tie him up and leave him to be devoured by wild beasts. Uh, as he prays, he says, and especially if you follow the original wording in the manuscripts, he says, uh, he prays, according to my faith which is in me, <laughs> which is already kind of interesting, right? Yeah. According to my faith which is in me, wilt thou give me strength that I may burst these bands? And he seems to imagine this kind of uh, extravagant event, right? I'm going to just... <laughs> Right? Uh, and everyone's going to see my power. And it says, and the Lord did loose the bands from off my arms. feet." <laughs> right? So God's response in, uh, to Nephi's prayer is to say, cute, nice. I'm glad you want this to be a big spectacular event. There, we're taken care of. Now get back to work. And I think Nephi, by telling the story, is showing us like, I was a kid with a lot of sort of romantic, fanciful notions I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, and he's writing it again, looking back. Yeah, 30 years, uh, yeah, right? Yeah. Your next chapter, chapter six, focuses on the place of women in the text. How do your students tend to approach this as they're reading the Book of Mormon? I mean, this is a question all of my students have, and it feels like every semester more. And every semester after we've worked through the question of women in the Book of Mormon, I'll have students come up and just say, I can, I can read the Book of Mormon again. I could not find myself in this text, and this has made it possible. So this is a live, very live question right now. How on earth do we make sense of gender in the text of the Book of Mormon? Can I have you read a paragraph, actually? Sure. I have it right here. Um, you lay it out really well. Yeah, so this is uh, from, my own, from my own chapter. Uh, readers find few women in the Book of Mormon and fewer with names. When women do appear, they're generally nameless and faceless, grouped with the children in the background while men stand at center stage. An alarming number of the stories involving women feature violence, whether attempted or actually accomplished. Consequently, the Book of Mormon feels less and less readable in the 21st century, that is, in a culture of progressive emancipation for women. Despite the book's inclusion of some stories of promise for its female characters, for example, Abish, some lament that they have to suppress or ignore an implicit message regarding gender to find value in scripture. And there's reason to think that the problem begins already with First Nephi. Yeah. So let's, let's proceed down that a little bit. How does your book tackle that problem? Yeah. So uh, unfortunately for my purposes there, I have to really just focus on First Nephi. There, I think there's a lot to say about the Book of Mormon as a whole. But what I try to show is that the problem we find throughout the Book of Mormon has its seeds in First Nephi, that we watch the story in First Nephi carefully and see how a first generation with at least relative gender equality, something like relative gender equality compared to the rest, of the, text, to the, rest yeah. of the text gives way to a culture that will then become oppressive in a really obvious way for women. So for example, you compare Sariah, the mother of Nephi uh, and the rest of them and, and the matriarch of this family, you compare her with Ishmael's daughters who aren't named at all. What are some examples of what that comparison suggests? Yeah, the key here, I think, is to look at two stories that Nephi tells in a way that I think is supposed to draw our attention to the similarities. We get the story of Sariah complaining against Lehi, 1 Nephi 5. We get the story of the daughters of Ishmael complaining against Lehi. Same thing in First Nephi 17. And if you lay the story side by side, they follow a very similar pattern. And there are even some repetitions of phrases and such that suggest Nephi is trying to connect these. But when you look at the similarities, then also differences pop out. In the story about Sariah and Lehi, there's a confrontation, male, female. At the end of it, there's a kind of reconciliation. Sariah has her say, and she's the one with the last voice. She gets to say, now I know of a surety that God is in this. He's protected my sons, uh, and so on. And then they together go and offer sacrifice. In the later story, Next Generation, the daughters of Ishmael raise these complaints. And before they can actually have a genuine confrontation, male, female, let's have this out males speak up and usurp their concerns. We get Laman and Lemuel taking over the voices of the daughters of Ishmael and saying, see, Nephi's a problem. And, and it becomes instead male-male rivalry and women retreat into the background. And then they don't get a say at the end like Sariah did. At all. Yeah. In fact, instead, we get Nephi echoing Sariah's uh, yeah. testimony so that Nephi now takes the voice of the women. Yeah. So in the sense of likening scripture in terms of sort of applying it to our current situation, sure. the, the way that I think most Latter-day Saints think about uh, likening. One thing that your book suggests, um, or at least this is kind of my reading of it, I don't know that this is explicit, is that readers can actually see perhaps ways that, uh, that Lehi and Nephi were leaving women out 
which resulted in problems, which resulted in complaints. There were kind of legitimate complaints. Like it doesn't, we don't see a point where anyone pulls Soraya aside and says, Hey, here's the situation. What do you think about this? Or mm -hmm. I had a vision about this and here, you know, what are your thoughts? We don't see those things happening. And you have to wonder as a contemporary reader, if, if the women had been involved, uh, if the plans would have shaken out differently, if the complaining wouldn't have happened because they would have been part of the decision-making process from the beginning and those type of things. So yeah. the Book of Mormon in that way can sort of give an example of or prompt us to think about better ways, prompt readers to think about better ways that women's voices can be included in the community. Yeah. Well, and I think the overarching message of the Book of Mormon regarding gender, ironically, and take some time to spell it out in detail, is that one of the reasons the Nephites are destroyed is because of what's happening with women. Hmm. Uh, and Deidre Green in her volume in the same series spells this out in some detail. She's doing Jacob. The Book of Jacob, yeah. because Jacob explicitly says, Lehi received commandments regarding the relationship between men and women, and that's not happening among the Nephites. And for this reason, you will be destroyed. But it is happening rightly among the Lamanites. Mm -hmm. And for this reason, they will be preserved. Mm -hmm. And as you run through the rest of the Book of Mormon, we see story after story after story of Nephite, of women in Nephite contexts being oppressed and violently treated and so on and so forth. And the glimpses we get of Lamanite society, we have figures like Abish or the Lamanite queen who clearly actually has political power, right? Uh, and so on, the, the mothers of the stripling warriors. And, and there's every glimpse we have of Lamanite society, we have a sense that there's at least relative gender equality going on. And these are the ones who are preserved at the end of the book. Hmm. If we liken that, I think the message is, hey, Israel in the last days, get gender equality right or destruction looms. So Joe, you've written several books already about the Book of Mormon. You've done projects on Nephi. You edit the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. You've read so many things about, about this scripture. But as you're working on this project in particular, this brief theological introduction to First Nephi, was there anything new to you? Was there anything that changed in how you viewed Nephi? Yeah, no question. Uh, I mean, I have worked on a lot, and so a lot of what I was doing in this book is synthesizing past insights and trying to repackage it for a better, wider audience, right? Um, but uh, but yeah, there were things I saw for the first time as I was working on it, and unfortunately, some things I've seen since that I wish I could put in the book, but uh, that's all right. <laughs> that's how it always goes. Right? Um, so I'll mention two that were particularly new to me. So one was one I mentioned earlier, and that is that First Nephi ends with Laman and Lemuel reading Isaiah. Like that had never hit me before. Mm. That it may be important that that's the, the sort of end, the talos of the book. Everything is leading to this moment where Laman and Lemuel are contemplating the future for their children. Mm. Um, that I think is really quite beautiful. And like Nephi retains a hope for them in some exactly. regards. Yeah, the book ends on a note of hope. Yeah. Second Nephi is going to complicate that, but first Nephi ends on a note mm -hmm. of hope and that had never struck me as powerfully as it did here. Um, the other one though, that, uh, and I've thought about it quite a bit more since I've written the book, but I, I had never really glummed on before to the fact that at the very beginning of Nephi's vision, when the spirit is still there before the angel comes and takes his place, the spirit tells him to watch for a very specific moment. I want you to watch for this figure descending from heaven. And that's who you're going to testify as the son of God. And I'd never, one, really just thought about why that might be important. But two, especially, I had not reflected before on the fact that this means we're being given a kind of guide to reading that vision. We tend to read that first chapter of the vision, First Nephi 11, as kind of the core. Here we're laying the, the, the incredible Christian foundation. He sees the Lamb of God and his life and his death. But he never sees in chapter 11 a figure descending from heaven. Hmm. Nephi is pointed past the life of Christ to Christ visiting his own, his own people. Hmm. Uh, and that had, I had never seen that before. And it's given me a way of reading Nephi's vision very differently rather than it's starting at this sort of highest level and then kind of, oh, and also there's Nephite history. The focus is Nephite history from the beginning and the visit of the Lamb of God there. And part of what that means is that chapter 11 is introducing us to the figure who will come to the Nephites and Lamanites. Uh, and that's, uh, and that's actually, I think, um, it's got more to teach me still things I've learned since, uh, 
It's striking that then as the vision continues in chapters 13 and 14, and we're getting the Gentiles, and we're getting the redemption of Lamanites in the last days and what this all looks like, the solution to all the problems, the Gentile church and all this stuff, the solution is the Lamb of God says to Nephi, I will come and visit your children. So he points Nephi back to that same chapter 12 Mm -hmm. and that moment that he'd anticipated. And that's where I'm going to give you the plain and precious that will be written and sealed up and can come forth in the last days. So that moment is the key moment of the whole vision. And I I had not seen that before working on this book. So you've spent a lot of time with Nephi. How would you describe your, your, your relationship with this (laughs) prophet? Uh, I mean, maybe somewhat uh, vulgarly, I often call him my homeboy with my students because I really feel like I spend a lot of time with Nephi. I've got a sense for him. Uh, I'd say this, though. I I feel like I get Nephi, that he's he's a well-meaning kid that we too easily in the 21st century sort of dismiss as arrogant and and self-righteous. I think he's sort of cluelessly self-righteously self-righteous right he's not intentionally self-righteous he's not arrogant he's so earnest that he doesn't realize how he comes off i actually think the best portrayal we've ever had of nephi is orson scott card's science fiction novels he does he has a five volume science fiction series called homecoming uh and the first four volumes are the story of nephi he's adapted it in the science fiction world Mm. and his portrayal of the nephi character whose name is nephi he's not hiding what he's doing (laughs) uh is really quite beautiful i think he gets nephi right nephi is not nasty or dismissive he's just he's so intensely focused that he doesn't realize that he can alienate others. Hmm. Uh, and I think that's what I've come to see in Nephi. He's a, he's a beautiful soul that can can be hard to get to know. He's got this task fixation and he's like, yeah. gonna going to carry through with it. Yeah. And so he gets a lot done. Also, <laughs> yeah. he can be hard to work with. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's Joseph M. Spencer. He's assistant professor in the Department of Ancient Scripture here at Brigham Young University. And he edits the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. He's also written a number of books on the Book of Mormon, including An Other Testament, and his latest book is part of the Brief Theological Introduction series to the Book of Mormon that the Maxwell Institute is publishing. It's called First Nephi, A Brief Theological Introduction. And if everything goes according to plan, this should be available, at least in Utah bookstores, right before Christmas yeah. um, and, and available online shortly after that. And uh, it also should be available in ebook form to everybody before Christmas as well. Yep. All right. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate you taking the time to talk about this book with us. Yeah, thanks, Blair. That begins to cover First Nephi. There's plenty more to talk about in that book, but we're going to move to the next one with Terrell Givens. He's the author of the Brief Theological Introduction to Second Nephi, next time on the Maxwell Institute podcast. But before we go, I also want to check out the review of the month here from J.M. Gillens, I think it's pronounced. I'm I'm not 100% sure, but J.M. Gillens or Gillens says, I love this podcast. The Maxwell Institute podcast is definitely in the top three of my personal feed. Blair Hodges and Terrell Givens are conscientious and insightful interviewers who bring valuable knowledge, experience, compassion, genuine interest to every episode. I enjoy the breadth of topics covered, ranging from subjects I'm already interested in to disciplines I know nothing about. Thank you for opening my mind to new things and nourishing me with the word. Thank you for writing that review. We always appreciate seeing reviews. It helps spread the word about the show and grow our audience. We're always grateful to have more listeners. You can help us do that by leaving a review, rating the podcast in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, and also recommending the Maxwell Institute podcast to friends, family, people in your ward. Coming up next, Terrell Givens on 2 Nephi. 